机器喂，不上就给。把机器喂，哎，关门，是不是？莫马里，把机器喂，不上。Ce soir, je vais être honnête. C'est pas eux qui sont mauvais. Ma chichi ouais, ou j'aime choquer. Ma chichi ouais, et quand est-ce que je suis mon ami? Ma chichi ouais, ou j'aime. Okay, everyone. Hi. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Those are just some background slides um, from Canadian artists. And the music was from Indigenous artists in Canada. And you can find their music. Their names are Lawrence Teeth and um, Canon. And welcome to the One Health uh, seminar series. This series is organized by the University of Guelph's One Health Institution. My name is Radhika Gandhi, and I'm an MSc student in the Department of Population Medicine, and also one of the One Health students. It's my pleasure to be facilitating today's seminar. To start things off, we acknowledge that we are here today on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people of Turtle Island, who have made significant contributions to strengthening our community, province, and country as a whole. In particular, we acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral land of the Attawandaran people and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We uphold the significance of the dish and with one spoon covenant to respect the land's offerings and people's sharing the territory. We recognize that this gathering place and all the places we are joining from today is still home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. As an individual who has settled on this land, I'm grateful for the opportunity this land has provided me with and want to thank all the generations who have taken care of it for thousands of years. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to inform you that this seminar is being recorded. The recording will be posted to the One Health YouTube channel and a link will be made available on the One Health Institution website. The recording may also be used by the One Health Institution in the context of promoting and showcasing One Health work being done on our campus. If you have any questions or concerns about the recording or One Health generally, please contact us at onehealth at uoguelph.ca. I'll also pop this email into the chat so it's easier to access. At the end of the seminar, there will be time for questions and discussions. You can ask your question either by raising your hand and when invited by myself, asking the question or by typing it in the chat. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Lauren Grant is an epidemiologist and an assistant professor of environmental and public health in the Department of Population Medicine. Dr. Grant obtained an MSc in biochemistry and biomedical science from McMaster University and a PhD in biochemistry and biomedical sorry, an MSc in biochemistry and biomedical science from McMaster University and a PhD in population medicine from the University of Guelph. Following her PhD, Dr. Grant completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Dr. Grant is particularly interested in social and environmental determinants of One Health and how these determinants impact health and health inequalities. This, these interests will form today's seminar titled One Health and Social Determinants linking non-health data to improve health and why it can be difficult. So please welcome me in listening to Dr. Grant's 
um, talk today. Thank you so much for that um, introduction, Radhika, and I really appreciate um, being able to present today. I'm going to share, I'll try to share my screen. I don't usually use Zoom, so we'll see how this goes. Um, I guess I will start slideshow. Does that look okay from your perspective? Yes, that's yeah. perfect. Okay, let me see if I can just minimize. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, present today and to interact with you, um, at least in a virtual environment as part of the uh, winter seminar series for the One Health Institute. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, One Health and social um, environments and how we can sort of study um, the link between uh, social and environmental determinants and health by uh, linking different types of data to get a more complete picture of what exactly is going on. And then some of the difficulties that can arise when we try to do that, but also some of the tools that are now available to us that I really, I think the main takeaway, I'm hoping that um, people here today will take away is um, just uh, some new resources that are available to you that um, if you're interested in this space, you would be able to use for part of your research. Um, just a quick disclaimer, if I sound congested, uh, it's not your connection, it is me. I'm on uh, the tail end of a cold and sinus infection, which has just been not overly pleasant. Um, so I'll do my best to kind of get through, but if I have to kind of break to cough or whatever, um, please excuse me. So I am uh, Dr. Lauren Grant. I'm a very new professor um, in the Department of Population Medicine. So I recently started uh, back in November. So just a few months ago, um, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be back um, in my former department where I did my PhD, but now to be on the other side as a faculty member and just um, getting to start my own research program. Okay, let's see, here we go. Wonderful. Um, so uh, Radhika, you did a great job uh, with the introduction, so thank you for that. Um, I won't um, add too much more. Uh, my research program though is really focusing on those really broader determinants of one house, so trying to get outside of um, sort of animal or um, demographic characteristics that we commonly think about when we think about different risk factors for health outcomes. Um, and going up one level, thinking about the broader environments that people and animals live in and how these um, sort of interplay with um, your behaviors and your demographics to influence um, health, health outcomes, and also the type of healthcare that you utilize. <clears throat> uh, so I think uh, probably appropriate to start off a One Health seminar talking about One Health. And so at the end of last year, there was actually a brand new statement um, that was released by a number of international bodies uh, providing an updated definition of One Health. And so I'm sure that many, if not all of you are familiar with uh, the more traditional definition of One Health, which is really thinking about the relationships and all of the interconnections between um, animal, human, and environmental health with the understanding that um, as there are um, positive or negative changes in the health um, in one area, that that is going to have um, impact and implications for the health of at least one, if not both of the other areas. However, when this statement came out, there was this really nice um, conceptual image that came along with the definition. And one thing that I really appreciated about this image is, um, the icon on the top right, which to me is um, showing that 
one health doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs um, in society and there are broader um, societal forces that influence um, the health of environments, humans and animals, and also um, the type and quality of connections between those three different areas. Um, if I was going to sort of add to this image, I would actually probably show um, an arrow going back to uh, the societal component, where when we see sort of changes in environmental or animal or human health or the interconnections between them, um, that can actually then influence what's happening uh, within society. It can influence uh, the policies that are being made, the attention that's being placed on different aspects of health um, and the responses that are generated. And so um, I think that's sort of a nice um, broader conceptual framework. And I'll actually be showing you another framework for some social determinants that also just emphasizes that um, the quality of health in these three areas um, is certainly influenced by broader forces that we can also study and have an impact on. <laughs> so as Radhika mentioned, uh, my lab focuses on social and environmental determinants of One Health in animal and human populations. And my research program really has, um, at this point anyway, as I said to mention, I'm very early on, um, three pillars uh, that I like to sort of group my different uh, research ideas into. And so the first one on the left is thinking about social and environmental determinants of human uh, population health and health system utilization. And later in uh, this presentation, I'll walk you through um, a study that I did a couple of years ago, which um, sort of illustrates how we can uh, look at these broader determinants and and influence on um, especially healthcare utilization. The second uh, pillar is really focusing on health inequities um, in population health outcomes. So this is really referring to um, unfair differences in health outcomes that exist um, across groups that we can define either based on social characteristics or environmental characteristics. And so many of you, I'm sure, um, following along with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we've certainly seen this um, play out in real time where we've seen a greater or disproportionate burden of uh, COVID-19 mortality or morbidity in certain uh, social groups, um, like lower socioeconomic status, um, for example. And so it's important to be able to document uh, these inequities to help inform um, action in this area. And then the third uh, pillar of my program, and one that's a bit newer to me, is thinking about social and environmental determinants of companion animal health and pet care utilization, which is, um, I think, an area where there's lots and lots of work that we can do. Um, and I'm quite excited to start exploring that in more detail. So the way that my lab um, really tries to examine um, determinants of sort of um, these sort of broader environments is by using linked data sources. And I'm going to go into more detail about um, what I mean by that and the types of sources that uh, we can use to help examine some of these uh, particular research areas. And in particular, I tend to focus um, more on quantitative methods so things like regression, um, some choice analysis, starting to dabble with um, machine learning methods to really interrogate the data and identify some novel risk factors that haven't been described before. Okay, so um, many of you here are probably quite familiar with the term determinant, but I thought I would just provide, <coughs> sorry, a really quick uh, background on what I mean by that. So when I say determinant, all I'm really referring to is just a factor that influences health. And so these can really be considered um, the root causes. Sometimes they're called causes of causes of health, depending on kind of how 
broad or how far back you're going. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of different uh, types of determinants and we can sort of group them um, into different bins. And so many of you will be familiar with um, more traditional biological determinants. So things like age, um, sex and gender, your genetics, um, your health or immune status. We can also think about behavioral determinants. So these would be things um, like smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, diet, how much physical activity you engage in, um, other types of risky behaviors that you may um, engage in. So things, uh, often we think about things related to uh, sexual health or drug use as an example. We can also look at uh, preventive behaviors. So things like your propensity to be vaccinated um, or engage in other uh, behaviors that are um, would promote health. Broadening out from that though, we start to um, think about um, other categories like social determinants. And this is really starting to get into areas where I'm quite interested in. So here we start looking at things like um, your socioeconomic status, which is often defined by your um, income level, your level of education, the occupation that you're engaged in. Depending on the context, sometimes you think about social class. If um, we're working in a population where a class system is present, other types of social determinants include things like um, food security, housing, uh, race and ethnicity, um, gender, early childhood um, experiences and status, as well as Aboriginal status tend to get um, sort of lumped into this notion of social determinants. We also have um, physical environmental determinants. So these are things like the uh, natural or built environment with which people interact, as well as all the different types of settings where people um, live, work and play including um, things like barriers, if especially if we're thinking about, um, uh, for studying populations which may have uh, disabilities, these might be um, determinants that we're quite interested in looking at. And finally, uh, we can think about ecological or environmental determinants. So here we start looking at things like natural resources, um, energy, uh, ozone, different types of, um, of nutrient cycling, climate change, aquatic systems, and, and the like. So you can see really that when we think about health and all the things that can influence health, um, it goes sort of much further beyond just your own kind of biologics. And we can think uh, much more broadly about um, the factors that influence your health downstream. So why am I interested in uh, social determinants, especially in environmental determinants? This was um, a nice infographic that came out from uh, the Canadian Medical Association. And here they were taking a look at what exactly are the things that uh, make Canadians sick. And often when we um, think humans and animals alike, we often think about um, your biology, right? So things like age or um, your immune system or things like that, especially I'm thinking about that right now, but in fact, um, that's actually only a small proportion of um, what exactly is causing um, poor health for Canadians. And in fact, when we take a look, 75%, right? So your life, so those are all those social determinants that I was just talking about. Often we um, will lump in healthcare access and utilization as part of um, our social structure. So 75% of um, what the Canadian said is actually more focused on these broader upstream determinants um, in the social realm um, and in the environmental realm, as opposed to um, more individual determinants that are actually um, influencing health. And I think that that um, is first quite striking, but also as a researcher, um, really kind of engaging. It, it makes me think quite a lot about the impact that we can have on health when we actually are starting to intervene at these 
um, more upstream scales. And so um, I think it just kind of makes me and other researchers think more broadly about ways that we can influence health by focusing on some of these non-traditional or non-health um, levers to help um, improve health further downstream. So as I mentioned before, um, there are different ways that we can sort of conceptualize how all of these determinants are interacting to influence health. And this was one that was proposed in the early 1990s. It's been around for a long time um, called the rainbow model, but it's a model that has really stood kind of the test of time in terms of thinking about um, how determinants can be first grouped together, but also um, interact, influence health. And so you can see here, um, the innermost layer is where we have all of our kind of biological determinants. These are generally ones that we think about, we can't do much about. Um, they're sort of immutable. We can't you know, change how old someone is, for example. Um, and so interventions aimed at the sort of innermost layer are probably less likely to be um, effective at a population level relative to interventions that we can implement at these broader layers. And so you can see um, as we move out from the innermost circle, we have our behavioral determinants. Um, those behaviors are influenced by the um, social and community determinants, some of them that um, we previously talked about. Those social networks that we're all involved in are influenced by the broader living and working conditions of our environments. And we can um, consider these conditions in different ways. This could be related to um, things like food and agriculture, um, education, employment opportunities, um, access to clean water, and so on. And then all of these living and working conditions are further influenced by these much broader um, socioeconomic, cultural, political, um, and broader environmental conditions. And when I was kind of thinking back to that um, One Health conceptual framework that I showed you at the very beginning, I just thought there was so much synergy between um, sort of the notion of One Health and society. And this rainbow model sort of showing that um, nothing is really occurring in a vacuum and that by focusing on um, sort of the broader upstream conditions, we can actually have um, influence on everything that comes underneath. And so it's an exciting place to, to research and to work in. Um, just to also kind of provide some additional... Oh, some um, additional context. Um, not only do we sort of have a sense of uh, the different types of determinants and how they interact, but in 2008, there was um, a large effort led by the World Health Organization to also try and theorize um, how all these determinants may um, interact with health. And as an epidemiologist, these types of frameworks are really important because they help us to um, organize and uh, define all of the different um, determinants and causal factors that we may want to investigate when we're looking at a particular um, health outcome or utilization of health services. And so again, um, the main takeaway from this, um, I guess, busy sort of framework is that um, nothing is occurring in, in the vacuum. And so on the far left, you can see those really sort of broader societal influences. This could be things um, like policies, politics, um, the values that uh, people hold, uh, cultural standards and expectations that people have, which really determine um, sort of how socioeconomic position is um, sort of possible within that society. And so that position can be defined through um, one's education, occupation, uh, income and social classes I previously mentioned. 
your sort of position in society really influences how likely you are to be um, exposed to different risk factors. If you are exposed, how vulnerable you are to those risk factors actually influencing your health. And then also um, how likely you are to uh, develop a certain health outcome if you have been exposed. Your socioeconomic position moving now to that third box really determines your ability to, um, or certainly determines the, the quality of your material circumstances. It can influence the amount of stress and other psychosocial factors that you may experience, as well as um, behaviors that you may engage in. And we know that all of these then have um, a downstream influence on the actual health status um, of, a, of a population as well. And so um, I think these types of frameworks are quite quite nice for sort of organizing how we think about social and environmental determinants and how they um, actually influence health sort of further downstream as well. Okay, so now that I've kind of given you a bit of a, a background, how do we actually go about studying social and environmental determinants? And so there's really two different ways, uh, broad ways. Um, the first is that as researchers, we can collect primary data uh, using survey methods. And so this would be, um, as a researcher, I have a very specific research question. I'm going to design a very um, specific survey or questionnaire to gather a whole bunch of information about um, social or environmental determinants that I'm interested in. I'll gather information about the health outcome that I'm interested in, and then I'll use all of that um, and analyze it using different methods. Um, the advantage certainly of, of using primary data is that you can be very specific about the data that you're collecting um, and you're sort of ensuring that the data that, um, that you have is really meant to answer the research question that you've posed. <coughs> One disadvantage, however, is that um, depending on the population that you're interested in, it can sometimes be very difficult to um, collect data from a representative sample, which can sort of um, limit sometimes the interpretation or our ability to generalize our findings to a broader population. Um, it's not always the case. Um, it certainly is, is dependent on the question that you're asking or the, the population that you're interested in. Um, but sometimes um, primary data can be limited in that regard. It can also be um, very expensive to uh, collect data um, and certainly take quite a bit of time as well. And so on the other side, uh, another sort of opportunity for studying these determinants is to actually uh, link and then analyze secondary data. And so what I mean by secondary data is data that's been collected for a different um, non-research purpose. And so an example, um, I'll show you a few examples on the next slide, but an example of secondary data for health would be something like OHIP records. And so we can get a lot of information about health outcomes and what people are using um, health services for based on um, your medical records, but it wasn't intended um, those records aren't intended for research. And so um, sometimes, especially when we're thinking about social and environmental information, generally that information is just missing, right? So in your OHIP record, I have no idea what your income status is or how much education you have, um, where you work, what um, your environments are like. And so um, that's really where the power of linking data sets comes in. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a couple of slides. And so this secondary data, we can analyze it at two different levels. We can think about um, the data at the neighborhood level. So here we're really talking about um, determinants sort of in aggregate. And so we can talk about, for example, the um, median household income of a neighborhood, 
or we can uh, more powerfully uh, look at the individual level. And so here, if we were um, following the same example, if we had median household income at the neighborhood level, we would have your actual um, income at the individual level. And there's uses for both, and we'll kind of talk about those as we go. Okay. <coughs> so <clears throat> generally for, especially for large representative um, populations, so for example, if we wanted to be able to generalize about the uh, Canadian adult population, there's traditionally been this disconnect between social, environmental, and health data, which has um, for a long time made it difficult, if not impossible, to study these broader determinants and how they're influencing health. And so starting on uh, the far right, some examples of health data that we may use, especially secondary data, are things, as I mentioned, like OHIP records, so physician billings. We have access to uh, prescription drug claims. We can look at um, hospital use, whether you've been hospitalized or visited an emergency room. We have records on uh, long-term care. We have birth and death records, as well as um, some researchers will do more specific uh, medical chart abstracts as well to uh, gain access to health information. Statistics Canada um, and other groups also um, run um, sort of different health surveys that we have access to. So things like the Canadian Community Health Survey or CCHS, the National Population Health Survey, Ontario Health Study, there's a number of them uh, that we can access where we can also gain a lot of information about um, health outcomes from those surveys as well. However, when we look at sort of social data or environmental data, um, there are completely different sources. And so on the far left, we often will get social data from things like the census, um, longitudinal immigration database, tax records, um, registered persons uh, database, and things of that nature. There's also just separate surveys completely for social data. So things like survey of household spending, labor force survey, and so on. And then in the middle, there's a completely different set of sources for environmental data. And I won't go through all of them um, in detail, but the point of this slide is really to say that um, when we're thinking about social and environmental determinants of health, all the data that we want to utilize to be able to ask questions um, uh, in this regard are completely in their own silos. Um, however, that has more recently is um, there's been a lot of effort to start linking these things and I'm going to talk about how we do that because it then really expands um, the power of our research to be able to look at these broader um, forces on health. Okay, so I mentioned first that we can think about um, these broader determinants at the neighborhood level. And one of the ways where we can link these determinants to health data is by using your postal code. And so oftentimes we have uh, social and environmental data that's aggregated by geographic area. And so the smallest geographic area that we can or that we have access to information about is called a dissemination area. And this represents about 400 to 700 people. So it's meant to be about the size of kind of a block, like a neighborhood um, of people. And um, people or groups like Statistics Canada will take all of the information about all of the households that are within that particular area and they'll just average it out and they'll publish information about that neighborhood um, as data that we can use. And so when we're thinking about these area level measures, um, part of it depends on the research question that you're asking and they actually do hold um, quite a lot of value. And so these area level measures really reflect, reflect um, the broader social and economic characteristics within which um, individuals live. 
And sometimes they might provide a more stable measure. And so, for example, at the individual level, um, your income might change quite drastically. Um, even within a year, you might be making uh, much more, much less than you were um, a year ago. Whereas um, within the neighborhood, because it's a more aggregate measure, they tend to be a bit more stable as well. However, sometimes um, we will use area level information as a proxy for individual level information, especially if the data is either limited or unavailable at the individual level. And so here we might say, okay, I know that individual X has this particular health outcome. I don't know how much money this person makes, but I do know that the median household income of the neighborhood that they live in based on their postal code is Y. And so I'm going to assume that this person makes the same um, amount of money as sort of the average amount within that neighborhood. And that's sometimes okay to do. And sometimes that's the best we can do. Um, if that, however, is kind of what we're doing as researchers, we have to um, have a bit more cautious interpretation because we can sometimes introduce something called ecological bias. Um, and especially if we're in areas with really high variability. So we can often think about, especially um, neighborhoods with high population density where you know, one side of the street could be um, a completely different socioeconomic status compared to the other side of the street. Um, then we have to certainly um, be a bit more cautious. And this is actually a really, um, I'll never forget this. This is such an aha moment uh, for me when I was watching uh, the results of the um, 2020 election come in. And I'm just showing an, an image on the right which is just showing um, sort of Democratic versus Republican um, counties in the state of Mississippi. And so often we think about like the deep South, it's like, oh, everybody's just Republican down there. But even when you look at this um, small little county, uh, if you can see it outlined in black, sort of at the bottom of the image, you can see here that even within one county, there are certain areas um, that are, Republican in certain areas that are Democratic. And so if we were using um, area level information, so for example, we might say, oh, this county is Republican, we would actually be wrong for sort of 36% of that population. And so um, just again, when we're kind of using this neighborhood level information, we sometimes have to be a bit more cautious about how we're interpreting our findings. <clears throat> More powerfully is when, more accurately, certainly, is when we can link um, social information to health information at the individual level. And so here we can say, um, person X has this health outcome and person X also reported um, this level of household income. And that's the information that I'm gonna use when I'm modeling uh, this individual. So here, there has been a ton of work done um, by Statistics Canada to link information at the individual level. And I do, again, this, this is like my takeaway slide. This data is freely accessible um, to researchers and to students through um, the Canadian Research uh, Data Centre Network. And there is a site at the University of Guelph. It's on the second floor of the library. Um, I have spent many hours in there, often by myself. So. Uh, quite an underutilized uh, resource to be able to access this information. And so here, um, Sisters Canada has linked a number of different social uh, data resources to a variety of health um, data outcomes at the individual level. And so um, you can be much more confident about the data that you're modeling and the interpretations that you're making would you use um, these linked data sources? And so again, if you have any interest in this, uh, please you know, consider these types of, of resources that are free to you to use. 
if we then wanted to add in the um, environmental component, there's lots of ways that we can do that. And so you can additionally link environmental information, um, which naturally exists at the neighborhood level um, using postal codes. And I'll just draw your attention to uh, one resource, which is the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, which um, publishes a number of different um, sort of data indicators for things like air quality, um, climate, as well as sort of um, built environment characteristics. So things around uh, different neighborhood characteristics like um, sort of light exposures, um, shade, uh, different greenness, walkability, that sort of thing as well. This is also a free resource uh, that's available to anyone to use. And so um, it's such a powerful thing to be able to take um, resources like this, like environmental information, and then link it to social and health information that's already been linked. Um, the types of modeling that you can do is just uh, tremendous. The types of questions that we can ask um, and sort of information that we can gather. We've just um, never been able to do research like this uh, for forever. Like these things have just come out in the last few years. So um, it's just a really exciting time to, to be kind of in this space. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through um, an example of how um, I have previously sort of examined um, these broader determinants and their influence on health. And so here I'm zooming in to a One Health system within human health. And this is really thinking about the intersection between um, public health, which is often focused on uh, preventive um, activities and primary health care, which is focused on treating um, diseases or conditions that are, that, are, that are already present. And really at the nexus of those two systems is something um, that I studied, which was avoidable hospitalizations for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. And I will walk you through what that means um, and how I did it. That's just as more of an example of how you can uh, use linked data in a really powerful way. So these um, ambulatory care sensitive conditions, there's a set of seven that are used by uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information as a marker of health system performance. And those seven conditions are, sorry, uh, angina, asthma, congestive heart failure, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, epilepsy, and hypertension. And so these are conditions where um, we know that we have um, effective um, outpatient care that can be provided to individuals. And so if you are hospitalized for one of those seven conditions, we would consider that avoidable because we would say we know within our healthcare system that we have care options that could have been provided to this patient um, before it got so aggravated that they had to be hospitalized in order to treat it. And so that's what we, um, that's why we call them sensitive to ambulatory care um, and why we consider these hospitalizations avoidable given effective and timely preventive or primary care. And specifically in Canada, we actually limit this definition to people under the age of 75. Um, not all um, health systems do this. So for example, in the States, they don't have an age limit, but here we would say, um, if you're 75 or older, um, it's quite possible that you have a number of underlying conditions or um, just in general, a poor health status where um, you might be more likely to be hospitalized. There probably wasn't much we could have done um, necessarily to prevent uh, you from, from using a hospital um, just given your older age. But for those younger than that, we would consider these, these hospitalizations for these seven conditions as avoidable. <clears throat> so if you wanted to study um, sort of broader risk factors 
for avoidable hospital use. Um, for quite some time, um, there was really limited data that we could use. And so either it was limited because uh, we just didn't follow people for a very long time. We didn't really have great uh, data sources that were linked to allow us to study these risk factors. And certainly at the national level, um, data was extremely limited, if just not present at all. But um, what would it have been maybe like three or four, yeah, four or five years ago now, um, Statistics Canada released the Canadian Community Health Survey linked to the Discharge Abstract Database. And I'll go through um, each of these sources, but this was such a powerful um, new linked data source that allowed us to start to examine these broader risk factors and their influence on health downstream. So our research question here was, what are um, not only demographic, but also those broader socioeconomic and behavioral risk factors for avoidable hospital use um, among Canadian adults? So here, um, we used um, eight cycles of the Canadian Community Health Survey. And so this is a nationally representative survey uh, that goes out um, generally annually or biannually. And it really collects a lot of different information um, on things like demographics, um, socioeconomic status, and socioeconomic um, other social variables, as well as information on health behaviors that you engage in, um, if you have any sort of um, comorbidities, your general health status, not just physical health, but uh, mental health, as well as um, your utilization of healthcare within uh, the past year. So really rich information on um, social determinants um, through the Canadian Community Health Survey. So that gets linked at the individual level through um, a household identifier and then a person identifier to the discharge abstract database. And what this is, is a national database. It includes all hospital um, discharges except uh, for those living in the province of Quebec. And here we have all sorts of information about uh, why you were hospitalized, so different um, diagnostic codes, what procedures were performed while you were in hospital. So we have intervention codes. We know the dates for when you were hospitalized, um, both admitted and discharged, so we can figure out how long you stayed, um, as well as your discharge disposition. So this would be, um, we would know if you were um, alive or transferred, or if um, an individual uh, died in hospital as well. So these are um, quite large data sets. And so by pooling all eight cycles of the Canadian Community Health Survey, we had over 600,000 um, respondents that we linked to over a million um, hospitalization records. When we applied our exclusion criteria, we ended up with a cohort of almost 400,000 um, respondents for us to analyze. We then conducted um, a sex stratified survival analysis to identify risk factors uh, specifically um, in males and then risk factors in females as well. And for those who are um, more epi uh, focused, we built um, a series of sequential models starting with our univariate analysis where we then sort of sequentially adjusted first for demographics, then for socioeconomic um, variables, then for behaviors, and finally uh, for comorbidities as a function of someone's um, health status. So here are some of the results of our study. And so this is specifically focusing on um, potential risk factors for males. And I'm just gonna sort of group them here. So the first kind of top six factors are those related to um, your demographics. And so just to orient you, um, the vertical line represents a hazard ratio of one, which would mean that there was um, uh, like no protective or no 
risk associated with that uh, particular variable. If the black square is on uh, the left, to the left of that line, it sort of indicates that this factor uh, might be protective for avoidable hospital use. And if the black square is on the right of um, that line, it would indicate that this um, variable might be a risk factor or might increase your risk for avoidable hospital use. And the further that that black square is um, either to the left or to the right of that vertical line, um, the stronger either the protective effect is to the left or the stronger the risk is um, to the right. And so you can see here that um, for males, for example, um, immigrant status was actually a protective factor against avoidable hospital use as an example. The next uh, grouping, we looked at income and education as um, uh, potential risk factors for avoidable hospital use as uh, indicators of someone's socioeconomic status. And so what you can see here, especially is that males who were of the lowest income or lower middle income quintiles were at greater risk for avoidable hospital use relative to those of um, higher income, as an example. Certainly, um, the strongest risk factors that we saw were um, more related to your behaviors. So things um, like smoking, for example, were strong risk factors for avoidable hospital use, especially for those seven conditions, um, along with um, obesity and uh, physical inactivity. Further, people um, with poor health status, so those with uh, more chronic morbidities, were also at increased risk for avoidable hospital use relative to those with fewer uh, comorbidities. So the same, uh, same sort of look, but this is uh, again for females. So again, we examined uh, sort of different demographic factors, also noticing not exactly the same patterns. There were um, some sex specific differences, but here again, we see immigrant status as being uh, protective for avoidable hospital use. Women of um, lower income were at greater risk as well as um, those possessing uh, less than a high school education. We again pulled out certain behaviors as being risk factors for avoidable hospital use, like smoking, um, uh, being underweight, uh, potentially some physical inactivity, as well as poor health status, um, increasing your risk for avoidable hospital use. So a key advantage of being able to use this linked data set is the ability to adjust for all these different variables at the individual level. And so here I'm just zooming in on um, male income quintiles. So the light blue bars represent um, our hazard ratio for um, our first analysis. So that was just our univariate analysis. And then as we sort of progress to the right, we were sort of sequentially adjusting for demographics and socioeconomics, um, behaviors and health status. And so um, it gives us, uh, as epidemiologists, a much more um, nuanced interpretation of risk when we can control for all sorts of potential um, confounders as we sort of model this, uh, this data. And here, same thing for females, uh, I'm just using um, female smoking as another example. <clears throat> and um, if you're an epidemiologist, uh, we did sort of a number of additional analyses to take a look at some of our model um, assumptions. So uh, just different BMI values and restricting follow-up time and that sort of thing. And we found that our, our results were quite robust um, for what we found. So what exactly are the implications when we're thinking about um, a one health system like the nexus between um, public health and primary health care? And what we pulled out was that some of the strongest risk factors were actually things that um, primary health care doesn't focus on really. 
So things like smoking, for example, that's really in the domain of public health. And so I think um, for me, the real takeaway was that interventions that are happening at a much um, more upstream level, so things that are happening at a public health level, can have a, um, a really strong impact um, further downstream on primary health care use. And so if we're sort of thinking about how we can, um, for example, reduce avoidable hospital use or um, the need for primary health care, one of the, um, I think, answers is to look upstream and to look at how we can um, sort of better work with public health to um, enhance overall population health and, re and reduce uh, the need for um, health system utilization. Okay, so kind of going back to um, that first slide that I showed you, I just wanted to emphasize um, some areas where I see sort of immediate research opportunities um, now that we have the ability to link social and environmental information with health information. So certainly um, in my lab, foodborne diseases is one area where I think there's a lot of opportunity. This again is an area where when we have a case of, of a foodborne disease, we'll collect sort of basic information about you, your age, um, your sex and gender. But again, we don't collect any social information. And so by using linked data sources, we can start to identify new risk factors that we haven't been able to examine before. Um, on the uh, veterinary side, there's, I think, just a ton of opportunities. Um, and certainly some interest for me are things around uh, translational diseases, uh, potentially starting to do some work with um, canine epilepsy and leptospirosis to, again, um, use those veterinary uh, medical records. We have postal code information in those records. And so we can start to link back to information about um, the neighborhoods uh, from which these animals are coming from and some of the social and environmental characteristics of those neighborhoods to um, gain a more comprehensive understanding of what exactly is determining uh, risk of disease within these populations. And I will stop there. I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks a lot, Dr. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I Thank learned you. a lot. I learned a lot. There was a lot of stuff that I didn't know, especially about the Canadian Research and Data Center Network. So thank you for that. Um, so it is, it is time to take questions, but I am cognizant of the time. If anyone has to run, you can always reach out to Dr. Grant directly. Her information is available on the One Health Institution website. So there's a point of contact there. But other than that, I can take any questions anyone has right now.